So he has done great things. So he has done great things. Oh, he has done great things. So we bless his And I will bless the Lord. Come on, sing it out. Oh, my soul, and all that is, and all that is within me, bless his holy, his holy. Let's sing that one more time. I will bless the Lord. Everybody say, and I will bless the Lord. Come on, lift your hands and say, oh, oh, my soul. And all that is within me, I bless it. Say he has done great things. Oh, he has done great things. So we bless his holy, his holy name. Say, oh my soul, I give to give him glory and all that is within me. Bless his holy, his holy name. Come on, give God praise in this place. Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen. amen. I will bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. We serve an awesome God. And I'm so grateful every day because I know me that he accepts me. That's why it really doesn't matter so much what anybody else thinks about me because I know my God knows me and he chose me. And so I'm always grateful to give him a hand of praise. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father, we thank you so much. We're grateful that you have blessed us. And as we tackle this subject, may you tackle our spirit. Let us focus what you desire for us to hear. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. We want to continue in this series on the age of Elohim. And for those of you who may be hearing this for the first time, the age of Elohim means the age of God. I'm here to tell you that despite the fact we may call this a dangerous age, a deadly age, a troublesome age, it is still the age of God. 
because God is large and in charge. Can I get amen? amen? And so we're looking at this subject. Oh, thank you. We're looking at this subject, Heaven's First Avenger. Heaven's First Avenger. First of all, I want to make it clear that the Bible makes it clear to us that of all the things you think, Romans 12, verse 19, he wants you to know that heaven has an avenger and you are not it. In other words, God wants to make it clear that do not seek revenge for yourself. Romans 12, verse 19 says, do not take revenge. It says, do not take revenge. It's not going. Are you there yet? There we go. So it makes it clear in Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. So let me make it clear again, I don't care what anybody has done to you, don't take revenge at the board meeting. Don't take revenge during election time. Because honestly, Revenge is something that is in God's hand, and I'm glad it's not in man's. Because some of us will do like my daughter did me. On Friday night, we used to have what's called WW Smackdown. And that's when my daughter, not daughters, because Kayla was too scary to wrestle, Kayla would stand by on the perimeter and act like she's wrestling. But Yvonne and I would get to wrestling, and my wife just could not stand it, just like she can't stand to see us wrestle now with two boys. And i never forget one night we were wrestling, and yes, my wife is a prophetess. She says somebody's going to end up getting hurt. Sure enough, Ivana got hurt. She cried. But, you know, I'm trying to toughen her. So I'm like, you know, warming up, all right? And so... I turned around and went to bed and was lying in bed with the lights out when all of a sudden I didn't know she was plotting. She got revenge. In the middle of darkness, she crept, crept in the room and went airborne with her elbow and got me. I was just too man to cry. But the Lord said, do not seek revenge yourself because God is an avenger. Can I get amen? amen? And so in this uh, text that we are reading, it makes it clear that something is going on that is troubling John. It is so troubling that John starts to cry. He starts to weep. And, and, and yet an angel said, look, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loosen the seven seals and he said, now look and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. I read all of that, and I know you're trying to figure it out, but just in case you forgot last week, everything that is going on in the book of Revelation is about one thing and one thing only, that the devil wants God's worship. So whatever's going on here is pertaining to worship and God's worship and the enemy's worship because he said, I will be like the Most High. So this is his attempt to be like the Most High, and we must understand in the reading of this book in chapter 5 what it means so that we are convinced again that nobody is like God. Can I get amen? In Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, uh, the, the entire chapter, we see here, uh, John, hears an invitation to all the universe. It's proclaimed by a mighty angel that if anyone can open the scroll, he's asking them to step forward. You remember this old game show that used to be on where they try and they put three people up there and they'll say that this person is John Smith. And that person is John Smith. And that person is John Smith. And then they'll turn around and have all of them just tell stuff about John Smith after they ask questions. And then they'll say, will the real John Smith stand up? Okay? So here what John is saying, will the real person who can open this book step 
forward. And we find that he does step forward. This book is called a scroll. The scroll is a piece of paper that is written on, and according to this text, it was written on the front and the back. And what they used to do with the scroll, they would turn around and write front and back on the page, and then they would roll it up. Then they write on another page and roll it up and roll it up. And they rolled it up in such a manner that in order for you to open it, you had to open it the reverse of how you rolled it. In other words, you didn't open the first page first. You opened the seventh page first, and then you rolled it down. And I was trying to figure out why did they do it that way? Why was he unrolling these things? And I found out that what he was saying is, as you unroll it, you get to know what's going on, but you won't completely know and understand until you have unrolled the entire thing. So see, in prophecy sometimes you don't understand until you have read the whole thing. Not in bits, not in pieces, not in parts. And so here they sealed it up. And when you read Revelation 5, 6, 7, and 8, and 9, it helps you to understand what these scrolls were all about. These scrolls tell us an important thing. They tell us three things that I want you to understand. They tell us who's sitting on the throne, what is the book in his hand, and who is able to open it. This is what we'll find out today. Who's sitting on the throne? What is the book in his hand? And who is able to open it? John's vision of this conquering line of Judah is equated to a slaughtered lamb. This lamb is the only one worthy to open a sealed scroll given by God. John hears a heavenly elder speak about a lion of Judah, an expression that recalls God's promise to send a powerful king from David's line who would build the kingdom of God. So when John turns to see the lion, however, he sees a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. And the image of the slaughtered lamb recalls the Passover when the blood of lambs protected people from the power of the destroyer. So John sees this lion and this lamb figure, which are really one figure, but two characteristics. He says, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book nor to even look within. This book is sealed. This book is closed. It is closed for a reason, but one day, according to Revelation, it was going to be opened. He goes further and says in verse 6, And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. There go the sevens. Seven, seven, seven. Seven means complete. So whatever it is, it is seven horns. And horns represent power. Everybody say power. Horns represent power. So whoever this is has all power. They are all powerful. It goes on and says seven eyes. Eyes represent wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if you run into a sister that got seven eyes, I don't know if that's wise. All right? That's scary. Can I get an amen? But it says seven eyes. The seven eyes complete wisdom. Only one person has complete wisdom. And then it says seven spirits of God. Everybody say spirits. Seven spirits of God. Now, if somebody got seven demons, that's not the spirits of God. These are seven spirits of God, meaning complete authority under the spirit of God. And whoever this is came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Well, I want you to know that Jesus is all powerful. Can I get an amen? In Luke chapter 1, verse 69, it says, And God has raised up a horn of salvation for us, in the house of his servant David. 
In other words, Jesus Christ was a descendant of David. He's called a horn. Horn represents power, and he has all authority to save mankind. Can I get an amen? And so you and I must understand that salvation is complete. I am so tired of folk when they are asked, are they saved, that they say, I hope so. Jesus did not come down here hoping to save us. Jesus saves, and we must accept it. Can I get an amen? So you are not hoping you're saved, thinking you're saved, want to be saved, wish you were saved, going to be saved, for by grace you are saved. And I sure wish we'd act like it. Salvation is something that God had the authority through Jesus Christ to give us. He's called a lion and a lamb. Last night we were watching a video on lions and I never forget that lion yarned and opened his mouth, and I could just imagine my head there. And I was like, you know what? They look like something you want to bring home, but if you do, you're in trouble. Huh? And so, but here it is being portrayed as making sure you understand God is not the king of the jungle. He's the king of the world. He's the king of the earth and heaven. He's all authority. But yet, at the same time, he's a meek and lowly lamb. Now, this is what scares me about this. Most of us want to call Jesus our Savior, but we don't want to call him our Lord. See, there's a difference. See, a Savior would be the lamb, meaning that he'd give you all the benefits of salvation, done everything, did everything for you took your place, stood in your, st your stead. But a Lord is a lion, meaning that he has authority over your life. He's got authority over your life. Your life is not governed by you. Your life is governed by God. Can I get an amen? A woman once told me when I was trying to get the Holy Spirit in the Pentecostal church, she told me that God told her to tell me that she is my wife. But I remember that he's Lord of my life, too. And I said to her, but he hasn't told me yet. See? And so he governs your life, not someone else. You can't blame somebody else. Often when people find new theology or doctrine in the Bible, they'll tell you, well, I was raised this way and that way, and my mama is saved, so what's going to keep me from being saved? Here's the difference. God expects you to do what you find out even if you didn't know it before. You, you, you can't stick back there. It's like I told somebody, I, I didn't turn around and, and, and end up getting a doctorate in kindergarten. I had to move on. When I learned more, then I had to move on. You and I must understand that ultimately God's word is the authority, not your mother's tradition, your father's tradition, your pastor's tradition, not even your tradition. Tradition is not religion. Tradition is something often that we use as religion or as an excuse, and often we don't even understand the tradition. It's like one woman turned around and was cooking Thanksgiving dinner, and lo and behold, her friend came over, and her friend saw her cooking, and she asked her a question. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? So she said, what do you mean? So she turned around and called her mother. She said, let me call my mother and find out. She said, Mom, I need to ask you a question. And she began to ask her. Her mom said, so you still cut off the leg of your turkey and the wings of your turkey, and you put it in your pot. She said, honey, the only reason why mama did that, her pot was too small. But the girl was doing the tradition because she thought that was the way to cook a turkey. Can I get an amen? And then he goes on to say, I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders, this lamb stood as it had been slain, having seven heads, seven horns, and seven eyes in the earth. And once again, we want you to know God has all wisdom, all power, and he is complete in the Holy Spirit. And the elder said unto me, Stop crying. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loosen the seven seals. 
So who is the person that can loosen the seven seals? Who is the person that has the authority to open that book? There's only one person and one person only, and that is Jesus Christ. And what's interesting about this is most folk don't really understand the position or role of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is one of the Trinity. We say the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's one of them. But when it came time to create man, God gave Jesus the authority to do it. The Bible says it is Jesus who shaped and formed us from the dust of the ground. And this same Jesus is the one who created us, is also the same one who recreates us by the shedding of his blood. But I got some news for you. He's also going to be the one that judges us. Okay, y'all got to catch that. He made you. He remade you. And he's either going to make you anew or condemn you. He's the same person. See, sometimes you like to see this picture of Jesus, this mamby-pamby Jesus who walked around. Everybody just think he's just as soft and just as gentle as can be. And they miss when he went into the sanctuary and pulled out a whip and turned over tables and, 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 and ran them out. Uh, one writer said that when Jesus went in the sanctuary, he had a robe on and, and that the sleeve fell back and they got scared when they saw his biceps. See, Jesus wasn't no mamby pamby man. Jesus was a carpenter. And anybody that uses their hand like Jesus did, it's going to be thick with calluses and they're going to have muscles like mine. And so they're going to be hefty and strong. Don't y'all deny me. I can dream if I want to. And so what we find is that he has the authority to open the book. Jesus is our first avenger. He's our avenger. There's one writer named Dorothy Sayers who said, the people who hanged around, I'm sorry, let me go back. The people who hanged Christ, um, never did they accuse him of being a softy. They didn't accuse him of being a bore. On the contrary, when they went to hang him, they brought soldiers with them. Huh? They ain't come just one person. They brought an army with them to do something with him. They thought him of being too dynamic to be safe. He was tender to the unfortunate, patient with the honest inquirers, humble before heaven, but he insulted respectable clergymen by calling them hypocrites. You see, we can turn around in church and have a board meeting or a nominating committee meeting, and we can have somebody that's a hypocrite or, 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 or mean or honorary, and we'll get in the meeting and say, yeah, I know they shouldn't be in office, but if we do, they're going to get mad. But Jesus Christ said, they're a hypocrite. They should not be in office. They should not be in position. And so he referred to King Harold as that fox. He went to parties in disreputable company and was looked upon as a gluttonous man and a wine bibber. He turned around. He was a friend of publicans and sinners. He assaulted indignant tradesmen and threw them and their belongings out of the temple. He drove a coach of horses and and, and, and he was not a mamby-pamby man. He is God, full of authority and power, Jesus Christ. But we have to understand something about this man who can open the scroll, this man who is worthy uh, to open this book. There's one thing about him. This man is worthy to be worshipped. He's worthy to be worshipped, and, and worship is such a central part of this controversy because worship is something that we fight over, we argue over, and I get tired of people thinking that worship is a style, worship is music, worship is, 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 is these other external things, and in essence, this is not what worship is about. You see, I know some churches, they are too quiet on worship, others are too noisy on worship, 
But the too quiet or the too noisy has nothing to do about why I say they are too quiet or too noisy. I say they are too quiet or too noisy because they're focusing on the wrong thing rather than focusing on the person. You see, you got to know how to worship. Do you all mind if I take just a minute to tell you how to worship? I just want to tell you how to worship. And I, and I want you to understand, when you walk out of here, your worship should never be the same because there are only two elements of worship. And if you take these two elements of worship with you, I don't care whether you are in a field picking cotton or in a store picking cotton. You can still worship. Huh? You don't have to be in church to worship. You don't have to wait until you are delivered from an accident to worship. You ought to worship because you are alive. And so here are the two elements of worship. The essence of worship is to, what's the first one? Can you read it? Okay, do y'all read English? Otherwise, I'll come back and do it in Spanish. All right, let's say it again. What's the first element? To recount, what's the second element? To celebrate. Now, I want you to understand this. I don't have anything against traditional testimony. Traditional testimony is fine. But when you read in Revelation and they say they testify, they say they testify of me, of me. And these are the two areas that you testify of God about. Basically, you recount your blessings. You recount them. Now, when we say recount, if you remember in the Old Testament when God delivered the people of Israel from any place, he told them to get stones and to put them out. Then he said, when your children come, they will see it, and they will say these words. What mean ye these stones? Why are these stones here? What's the significance of that? Then it says, now you rehearse how I brought you out, not how I bought you a car. Okay, let me, let me go back again. I'm talking about worship. How I brought you out through the wilderness, across the sea. How I delivered you from the hands of your enemy. I think sometimes we get so caught up in the things that God has given us that we forget about the things he's brought us from. See, we, we now live in the suburbs. We forget that we were in the hood. Uh, we, we, we now have air conditioning. We forget that we used to drive a car that had air on condition it was moving. See? So, so we forget. And so he says, you've got to recount. You've got to rehearse. You've got to remind yourself. And what I constantly remind myself of is how God saved me from the pit of hell. How he delivered me as a young person. And even how he delivers me now. I don't mind the other testimonies. They are well and good. But let me tell you something. We can testify about our car that's going to take us to Hollywood, but it doesn't mean it's going to take us to heaven. But we got to hear more about Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now. Most people are not going to come to Christ because you tell them God gave you a good job. People need to hear you recount the goodness of Jesus in a sense of saving you, preserving you, keeping you. Anybody here used to have a temper, but now God has tempered you? That's a testimony. Huh? It's just like I used to tell somebody. I used to be a mean brother. I was so mean that my mother told me that by age 12, I would be dead. As I mean I was. Y'all can't believe it. As kind as I am now, can you? <laughs> the reality is, in order to have true worship, you need to recount what God has done for you. Even as a child, it doesn't matter. See, I know what God did for me because I know that even my birth was a miracle. Because my mother was seven months or close, six months pregnant when she was in Chicago in the wintertime and slid down a flight of stairs, made it back to Memphis, and the next month I was born at seven months, weighing two and a half pounds. Now, we're talking about, he talked 
about the medical science and technology, back then it wasn't that good. Because they declared, because I was born and had to be in an incubator for a couple of two or three months, they declared that my brain would be slow. I said they declared. <laughs> they declared that physically I would be slow. They basically told my mother that she probably has a child that's going to be dependent on her for the rest of my life. So you know what happened? For two years, I was dependent on her. Let me tell you what. I never walked. I crawled for two years. They had to pick me up and move me. Two years. And then one day, there was a, y'all know what I'm talking about when I say this. Some of y'all are going to pretend you don't. A coffee table. <laughs> My mother said I pulled up to that coffee table. There was a bear on it. She said, I pulled myself up, grabbed that bear, and walked off like I've been walking for 30 years. <laughs> Went from dragging to walking. See, they said that I was going to have all of these problems. But I'm here today to tell you, my brain is not slow. Huh? And physically, I have done things that they would have never imagined. I played football. I was the starting fullback for the United States Marine Corps. Oh, no, I ain't slow. You don't believe me? Take my money and run. Yeah, take, take, touch my wife. <laughs> I remember one day my wife and I were out in Memphis coming out of a grocery store called Kroger's, and there were two brothers sitting on the curb, and as we walked out, they got up, and one of them went to approach my wife. I'm sitting there looking. I'm, you know, I'm a pastor, so I got to be the Jesus route, you know. So I'm like, sir, you know, that's my wife, whatever. And he cussed me out and said he didn't blank, blank, blank. So by this time, the Jesus in me didn't love the Jesus in him. So then I leaned over to my wife, and I said, go to the car. I go to the car. I began to take a Holy Ghost posture. You know, the Holy Ghost reaches out. So the guy turned around and kept coming, and by this time, if he took two more steps, I already knew what I was going to do. And his friend that was with him realized that I wasn't backing up. I wasn't backing up. I stood the ground. You're not going to touch my wife. And so, lo and behold, the guy grabbed him and pulled him away. So we got to the car, and man, I let my wife have it. I said, if I ever tell you to go to the car, it means get to the car, crank the engine, back out, roll down the windows, because I'm going to hit him and knock him out and jump in. <laughs> See, my wife is from the suburbs. She didn't know that language, all right? <laughs> but, but, but I look back and I see all of these things that transpired with me as a child, you know, getting stabbed in kindergarten. I know, you're saying stabbed in kindergarten. Who would get stabbed in kindergarten? I did. All because I sat in a seat. Anybody remember the reading circle? Huh? I sat in a seat that a guy had left, and he came back, wanted it back. I didn't give it to him, so he stabbed me about four times with a pencil in my chest. Then, I mean, I, I, I shot myself. I almost shot myself with my own bullet. I decided, because TV said that a, a, a garbage can top can block a bullet, I found a bullet, put it in the newspaper, set it on fire, got me a garbage can top, and waited to block it. It fired and almost went through my leg. Now, I have all of these kind of stories. Now, if you isolate them, it just seemed like an incident. But when you look at where I am today, and you look at the fact that I can talk to others and tell them what a mighty long way God has brought me. It is not about my car, my home, or things. It is about what God has brought me from. See, now you can worship behind that. 
you can stand at the kitchen sink and worship behind that because you know how good God has been to you. And so you got to recount. But then it said you got to celebrate. Now let me be clear. Celebration doesn't mean you got to have a band. You can celebrate. Our four parents celebrated in the woods without instruments. They celebrated with their mouths. They, they sang. They, they moaned and groaned. See, sometimes they had to moan because they didn't want the master to know what they were moaning about. And they made their moaning sound like melodious music. They turned around there and sang songs in, 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 in codes. And, and the master doesn't even know he's talking about them. They were celebrating the goodness of God when they said, I got shoes. You got shoes. All God's children. They were worshiping God. They didn't have to have the movement. Or they didn't have to rock. Whether you're young or old, it is not about the music of the band. It's about the music in your mind. I got a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. And it's the sweetest melody. See, your melody is in you. It's a part of you. So even if you come to church and there is no praise team you still can give God praise that's why he said make a joyful noise unto the Lord can I get amen, amen. that was for you non-singers you still make a noise and make it joyfully I remember being in a choir you know it was one of those choirs where anybody could sing in and I remember this one person oh my god it was affecting the whole choir I mean, how can one person dominate? It was so bad till you lost your note. And that person looking at you like, man, why are you off? But he was making a joke for no, can't get amen. <laughs> I just wish it was in somebody else's choir. But uh, let me go on. So, 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 so you still have to celebrate. It is a shame that you can go and get more celebration at a funeral than you can at a worship. I've never been to a funeral where there wasn't celebration. Bubba could have been the baddest thing on earth, drank himself to death. But you still going to talk about, oh, Bubba, let me tell you how Bubba was. Bubba, Bubba was good. Bubba would give you Bubba gum. Bubba was good. You're going to find something to say about Bubba. Some, there's something good to say about Bubba because Bubba was that, you know. Nobody going to talk about how bad a rascal Bubba was. You're just going to remember how Bubba gave you Bubba gum. You know, I just know Bubba. You see Bubba? Bubba always had Bubba gun. Bubba gave you Bubba gun. Everybody, amen. Praise the Lord. But yet I serve a risen Savior. And you can come into his presence and argue over whether you should or should not celebrate him. But you celebrate Bubba who's dead and won't celebrate Jesus who's alive. I'm saying, yes, there should be some emotion in your celebration. I'm tired of folk claiming cultural differences. Watch this. They celebrated at lynchings. No, 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 I'm being real. You can celebrate killing somebody, but then tell me that I can't celebrate somebody that can bring me back to life. No, it doesn't make sense. You can celebrate a touchdown. But you can't t celebrate a crucifixion. Oh, no, don't tell me it's cultural. Because I watch folk who culturally say they are not emotional get emotional about worldly things, but not about divine. No, you should celebrate. There ought to be celebration. I don't care what church you go to. There ought to be a celebration of some form about Jesus. And then I'm tired of us being the only group of people that they constantly say should have no form of celebration. Everything you do as an African American has to be about the devil, but yet I can go over to Holly, uh, uh, Hawaii and celebrate with the Polynesians. I can go to Luau. I can go to the Shinding, you know. I can I can celebrate with the Texans and everything, you know. We can do the we can do the hillbillies. We can do everybody. But you Negroes better not move, and we fall for it. Everybody else can celebrate, except you. You know why? Because when you celebrate, even when they thought they were binding you, you were free. 
It brought a freedom amidst everything that you were going through. It brought a freedom because you had a hope in Jesus Christ. You see, before you were set free, you declared you were free. Now you're free and you're bound. So if we're going to have true celebration, number one, you got to do what? You got to recount. Number two, you have to do what? You've got to celebrate God's mighty acts. Has God done any mighty acts in your lives? Then you ought to celebrate it. So when you walk through church next week on your way, you ought to have your list of mighty acts. I ought to see people who are almost walking through here just mumbling to themselves, God brought me from this. God has done this. I remember this. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. God has been good to me. He renewed my mind, my strength. I've mounted up with wings like an eagle. I'll run, and I'm not going to faint. God has been good to me. There ought to be celebration when you come in here next week. And then when somebody begins to sing a song of celebration, they don't have to pump you up because you're already pumped up. All you got to do now is just get up with the pump up. Can I get an amen? You see, before you come to church, you got to make sure you do like the football players, the football uh, uh, um, people who shout their team and they go out before the game and they have what they call it? What they call it? Not the cheerleader, but what they call it when they're on the parking lot before the game? Huh? You got a tailgate before you bring your tail up in here. You ought to tailgate at home before you come to church. Don't wait till you get to church and say, I hope it's going to be exciting. Aren't you excited about your Lord and Savior before you get here? Then tailgate. Tailgate at home. I remember my daughter got in trouble. And I began to reflect on some of the stuff that I did for you. I want you to catch this, that I didn't do for my own children. See, I was the first one at Sabbath school. My children never got the privilege of being with me on a Sabbath morning because I had to be with you. Yeah, I brought them to Sabbath school and they went to other people's classes, but they never got the chance to spend time with me because I was with you. So when my daughter got in trouble, she was grown. And I never forget the first time that we got up on a Sabbath morning and we began to talk, we began to share. Now I'm not telling anybody else, don't do this. I'm saying this was special to me because for 19 years of my child's life, I was here for you on Sabbath morning, not for them. So. We started getting around, I'll never forget. We got so caught up in talking and sharing and caring that I ended up late for Sabbath school. So I came in, I still got there, but I was a little late. This continued. This continued for over two years. And I remember somebody told me, I just can't believe a pastor doesn't come to Sabbath school on time. I ain't argue, I ain't say nothing. I was taking care of my child. My child, that I gave up time for you. See, you all don't understand. Maybe you ain't caught on to that. But when I am the first to come and the last to leave, and when many aren't even there at all, the first on Wednesday, the first on Friday, the last on Wednesday, the last on Friday, and then the expectation is you are always first. Well, this happened to be a situation where my child needed me. And I gave her that time. And guess what? My child is still in the church today. Oh, it ain't that she didn't have a father before. But I'm telling you, there was something special about those Saturday mornings where we got a chance to pray and talk together. That was my Sabbath school class, finally, with my own children. So don't you end up coming late or where the pastor was late. No, God gave me a divine mission. I wasn't doing late activity. I was still up early, but I had a mission to fulfill in ministering to my child. And you sit back and say to me, well, yeah, listen, my child was facing nine, 10 to 99 years in state penitentiary. 
Don't tell me not to take time. As a matter of fact, it was at Valley Fellowship that you all prayed, and my daughter was delivered, that they turned around, rather than giving her the mandatory sentence, January the 1st, I remember, we were here in church when the lawyer called and said, you will get probation. I remember we rejoiced over that. But it was because we spent time together that by the grace of God, my child is still in the church today. Can I get amen? So you've got to worship God. The essence of worship is worshiping God about his creation, that he created you, that he made you. Even when you feel as though nothing is going on on your life, remember God made you. You would not be here if God had not made you. I grew up in a time where because my mother and father was not married, they turned around and ostracized me and talked about me, and they had a name for me. It was called you are illegitimate. And lo and behold, back then, marriage was honorable, and most of the people I ran with had a mother and a father. And so, lo and behold, I go to school. It was embarrassing because a teacher would ask you your mother's name out loud. And if your mother's name was different from your name, they would laugh at you. And so they laughed at me, and lo and behold, I grew up believing I was illegitimate. But then I met a man. Oh, no, it's not who you think. This man's name was Hammer. And Hammer said, I was too legit to quit. And I began to realize that there was nothing illegitimate about me. You see, my mama and daddy had an illegitimate relationship, but I got a mama, I got a daddy, I'm too legit to quit. Ain't nothing illegitimate about me. And so you and I must understand that when you look at God created you, he made you, he redeemed you, and he's coming back for you, you ought to recount God's creative authority. And then last but not least, you ought to count, recount God's redemptive authority. He redeemed you. That lamb got the blood on it. That's the same blood that was shed when the Israelites had the plagues to come, the plague of death, and they put the blood on the doorpost and the angel bypassed it. You would be surprised how much has bypassed you since you accepted Jesus Christ. That blood has shielded you from unknown things that you cannot imagine. You're not here because you're special. And why? Listen, God has covered you with his blood, and you've avoided some things. Now, it's not all things, but enough for you to thank God that he redeemed you. You all remember back in the day, anybody remember the green stamps and those books? And you add up all these stamps so that eventually you can redeem them to get something? But I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ filled his book up for you long before you were even born. He declared, I redeemed you from your mother's womb. You've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. So even if you're having a hard time on your job, recount, God made me. Even if you're having a hard time with somebody, recount, God redeemed me. So that no matter what is going on in your life, don't lose focus on the account that you were created by God and redeemed by God. And you were even worship in the midst of your job problems. You got to worship anywhere, everywhere. Oh, no, you, you, you got to do it. It doesn't matter. You can go as far as this one person I read in a book by Watchman Nee that's called Practicing the Presence of God. Watchman Nee says that you can worship God anywhere at any time. He, in his book, said that there was a person who one time worshipped God while he was walking. And you sit back and say, was he out talking out loud? What was he doing? No. You know what he did? He turned around and had his personal worship with God. When he went for a walk, he invited God to walk with him, and he reached out his hand to hold his hand. He's practicing the presence of God. So he's walking with God as though he's walking with someone else. Another woman turned around and decided that when she would pray at night, that she would get on her knees. And when she got on her knees in her position, she would then move over and invite God to kneel down beside her. Another one turned around, was single, and was preparing a meal, would turn around and set the plate. 
And then before they sat down, they would put another plate, not with food, but an empty plate beside and ask God to dine with her. It's because he was practicing the presence of God. And if God is in your presence and you're practicing his presence, you can't help but worship. So who's worthy to open the book? The very God that you worship. And the opening of that book happened when Jesus Christ was nailed on the cross. It is then that we began to understand what is taking place in this great controversy that's happening between Christ and Satan, which is totally about who will be lifted up in your life. And so my prayer for you is that you understand you do have an avenger, but he's not an avenger who's waiting to avenge. He's already put his, most, his plan into motion. God is already getting revenge. He's getting it. You see, Whenever the devil reminds you of your sins, you ought to remind him of his destination. Oh, yeah, you, you, he has nothing on you. God has already redeemed you. He made you, redeemed you. He is your avenger. You don't need anybody else, only God. He has that book that was opened, those seven seals. He is the one. He said, and this is a testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has what? You don't have to hope you have it. If you have the son, you have life. If you have the son, you have life. That's why I always stay upbeat. As long as I have the son, I have life. And if I got life, I'm going to be happy. Oh, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Can I get amen? amen? It goes on a little further. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part in the book of what? From the what? Holy city and from the things which are written in the book. Now watch this. So if anybody takes away anything that's written in the book, they lose their spot, right? So the enemy is aware of that. So guess what the enemy start doing? I'm not going to take away the words of the book. I'm going to make sure they don't read it. See, you all think your lack of reading the Bible is accidental. You're bored. You're tired. No, it's a plan. They used to say if you wanted us to know any, if you didn't want us to know something, they said, put it in the book. That Bible has put more of y'all to sleep than it has waking you up. None of y'all need the, 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 the melanto or sleeping pills. Open the Bible. And you wake up and be in the same spot you were where you started. So it's not incidental because he knows if he takes away from the book, you're going to shout and go everywhere. He knows that. But if he can keep you from reading the book, then you absolutely have taken away from the book. Taken away, given time to read it, to know, to understand. And in the end, you will be deceived and caught off guard. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Y'all turn around and hid the word. It's in the, sitting on the coffee table. It's in the trunk of the car. You don't even know where your Bible is. I remember 10 years ago, I went to church and I took it. I'm not sure where it is now. So you got to know the book. So God has given us the greatest tool. I'm going to ask the musicians to come in now. He's given us a tool. And it comes down to what's going on, and that's the tool of choice. You have a choice. I have a choice. You and I can make decisions. That's why he said, I lay before you life and death, blessings and curses. And he says, choose. Choose. You, you get to choose. See, this is not one of those things where you're sitting, you go to the park, and maybe you're not the best player, and it seems as though nobody ever wants to pick you on the team. Even if there are only ten people, and they're down to nine, they seem to look around hoping that somebody else shows up. That's not your case. Your situation, God is inviting you 
He says, come, whosoever will, let him come. You can choose to be on whatever team you want. And I know sometimes you look over at the enemy's team and their players look so much bigger. They seem to be so much more athletic. And, and so you're like, yeah, I'm going to be on that team. But what you don't know, you've got to find out whose team it is. Because if it's not the right owner, I don't care what size they are, it's not the right team. Can I get an amen? You see, the right team is God's team. It's Jesus' team, the Lord's team. And it's not measured by size. It is measured by the size of your heart. God invites you to choose him. It's a choice. It's a daily choice on your job, at home. I'm going to go further. In your car. Because some of you all lose your religion over cars swerving in front of you or, or you're in a hurry and they won't move. And somehow you get a second nature. And you say stuff you shouldn't say. I'm here to tell you today. I have never lost my cool because of anybody swerving in front of me or almost hitting me or going too slow. And I'm going to tell you why. It ain't just straight because I'm saved. It's because I had a member of my church in Memphis whose wife was riding down the road, got into an argument with a fellow driver. She passed him, cursed him out. They had words, and she drove on down the road. He pulled up beside her and shot her in the head. I ain't arguing about no you. You went too slow. You, I ain't dying fast. I just sit back and just smile. That's, I'll get where I'm going. You'll get where you're going. Don't have road rage. You shouldn't have road rage if you're a Christian. Okay, y'all don't believe that. Some of y'all reserving some stuff in your nature. You should not have road rage. Not as a Christian. That's not persecution. Lord, why they persecute me? That's not persecution. You got to know whose side you're on. You have a choice. It's your choice. It's your choice. That's why he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. You were created to worship. You were created. The one who can open the book deserves creation. Worship deserves worship. You were created to worship. You were created to worship. Watch this. You were created to worship, not to worry. You were created. No matter what's going on, worship. All the time that I went through my car trouble, I was still praising the Lord. I praised the Lord that I could even try to fix it. I praised the Lord that I figured out how to fix it. I praised the Lord when it got fixed. And then watch this. And then something else went wrong. And you know what? I praised him again. You know why I praised him? I was about to take my grandson down the hill from where I live, and I got about two houses from my house when the car started jumping and carrying on. I turned around, pulled up into my driveway. I pulled into my parking spot, and it cut off and never turned back on again. Oh, I praised him. Oh, yeah. See, I'm saying when you learn how good your God is to you, nothing will stop you from praising him. Or you were created to worship. You're worshiping the God who has the authority and the power to open the book. And so the God who redeemed you, you're worshiping him. And so today I want to ask you, I want you to know Christ prevailed. He prevailed. Who can open the book? Jesus can because he's worthy. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy of worship. So today, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. There may be somebody here today who needs to make a decision. It's your choice, young or old. God said he created you to worship, so he needs worshipers. And what do I mean? If you have not given your way, maybe you have not even come his way. 
You fell away. You used to be a firm believer, but you back off of him. You start living a life outside of the will of God. And so you want to give your heart back to God. If you're somebody who you hadn't given it to God and you know you haven't, but you want to give your heart to God, then the first thing I want you to do is raise your hand. If you're somebody who drifted away, you, you, you left the church, you left Christ, you, 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 you gave up, but today you want to say, I'm getting up. I'm looking up. If there's anybody here today, will you raise your hand? You want to do so. You want to do so. Raise your hand. Then number two, if you want to declare to God, I am a worshiper of God and God alone, and I'll let nothing stamp out my worship, then I want you to stand. You're a worshiper of God. You're going to worship him. You were created to worship. You're going to worship him. Come with me. It doesn't matter. You're going to worship God. You're not going to let your job situation, your home situation, your school situation, your financial situation, your physical situation, your health situation, your mental situation, your social situation. You will let nothing keep you from worshiping God. Loving Father, you are our avenger. And by worshiping you, we're saying thank you for avenging us. Thank you for the promise of avenging us. Like the souls crying on the altar, how long? You still reassured them, not long. You let them know that everything is going to work out fine. You're going to take care of it. Often we're so caught up on this life that we forget the afterlife. We forget the life eternal, the life where we will never have any more sorrow or sickness or pain. No more financial problems or family problems, not even children problems. We forget that. But today we acknowledge, because you created us and you redeemed us, you are worthy to be worshipped. Bless us and keep us. and Watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us say amen. Let's worship God with our hands. Let's worship God with our hands and thank him for he created us to worship. On next Sabbath, our subject will be only one way out. Only one way out. Please invite somebody to come with you as we study the book of Revelation. Mmm. -hmm.